Hello and welcome to footballdiscovery.com. My name is Connor Nestor. Thank you for joining us on our second podcast. If you've been viewing our website, footballdiscovery.com, or whether you've looked us up on social media under Football Discovery, on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram, please follow and like our competition at the moment for two free tickets to Ireland vs Wales in March. Thank you for your support so far. This week we speak to Gary Tallon, who has a very unique football story. It's a story that starts in Drogheda United and ends up in Mansfield Town. But along the way, he's invited to Blackburn Rovers by Kenny Daglish, a Blackburn Rovers team that goes on to win the English Premier League. We start off by asking Gary, are there similarities between last season's Leicester City and the Blackburn Rovers team he got to train with every single day? So Gary, you would have gone in to work, I suppose, every day with the Blackburn Rovers squad that ended up winning the Premier League. People have spoke about um, Leicester City last season and said there's similarities. What do you think of that? Um, well, what Leicester City did um, last year was just absolutely phenomenal. I thought it was fantastic. And it proved that, um, to me, it proved that uh, you have a, a squad willing to work hard, great team spirit. It is achievable. But the time um, I had in Blackburn, um, I suppose you could think that uh, Blackburn were the modern day Chelsea stroke Man City in the early 90s because Jack Walker was the owner and he sold his steelworks for something in the region of 290 million sterling or sterling was very strong at the time so it was big money and he loved the club Blackburn so um, he gave it his all So I suppose that leads to a lot of people talking about Leicester City then more along the lines maybe of Nottingham Forest and what Brian Clough did but um, I think it was figured out Daglish's Blackburn at the time spent in around the same as Manchester United at that time um, but it probably looked like they were spending more money. The biggest signing was Chris Sutton, who is in the media quite a bit at the moment as a pundit, and is doesn't uh, come across as c- kind of shy or um, anything like that. What, what was he like when you when you worked with him every day? Yeah, it's a good point, that Connor, and uh, it doesn't say, sound as if he's changed much. Uh, Chris never hid behind the door. If he wanted to say something, <laughs> he'd say it, and if you didn't like it, well, it's a tough deal with it. You leave your feelings at home. It's nice being the biggest man in the dressing room, I suppose. So, but that was a pretty hard dressing room around that time. You had a lot of people in it. It was. It was, it was a great dressing room. Don't get me wrong. It was a great dressing room to be part of. And yet it was made up of all different characters. And um, there was, um, we'd say, there was regular training bust-ups in a good way. It was the competitive side, you know. There was great battles between Colin Hendry and Mike Newell. Um, it, was, it was fantastic, really. And you mentioned Jack Walker and Jack Walker's millions. I think the squad that won... That Premier League title, everyone except Jason Wilcox was more or less bought with his money. Um, Alan Shearer, obviously, from Southampton and lots of different players that we'll probably go on to speak about. Two of the people that make that list of Jack Walker's millions, I suppose, was an undisclosed fee for a Shea given from Celtic and 35000 for Gary Tallon from Drogheda United. Um, how did that happen? Well, Connor, I'm going to tell you something now. This is an exclusive because that's the <laughs> first time I ever heard my fee. All I heard was undisclosed. I thought I just went for a few training bibs and cones, but obviously not. <laughs> they, were, they were expensive training bibs. <laughs> 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 no, um, Shay Given, uh, what a pro he was. You could see from an early age. When I first went over to Blackburn, the only Irish player there was Kevin Morn, my idol, I have to say. Just everything about him. He took me under his wing. He, he was fantastic with me. In the end, by the time I was there, I ended up, I think there was about 12 Irish there, you know, which was fantastic. Um, but um, Shea Given, fantastic bro, you just knew he was going all the way. And talk to us about how, you know, what was going on with you at Dryda at the time and how did the move come about? The move came about, um, basically, I started off at uh, school, basically, you know, um, how I worked into eventually with Draw the Boys, got notes from school, Draw the Boys. And eventually went from Draw the Boys to, to um, Draw the United. Um, I've been on a couple of trials. Derby County was one. Um, um, and um, I had a few days there. Derby County came back, nothing happened. But then um, I'd like to actually mention Pat Devlin, who actually did an awful lot for me, Connor, basically. He was the reason that I did get to England. But I went to Liverpool on trial while I was at Draw the United. I was there for five days. Fantastic time. Loved every second of it. Um, nothing became of it as such kind of thing came back on the Friday got a phone call on the Sunday to say Kenny Daglish 
at Blackburn was offering me a three and a half year deal. I had 24 hours to think about it, take it or leave it. And if I liked it, wanted it, he'd fly over to Dublin Airport to sign me. And that's what happened. And so, so he comes over to Dublin Airport to sign you. What was that like? Unbelievable. Like, mum and dad were with me. Again, another reason why t- things went, you know, why I got to England. And that's, uh, mum and dad, I have a lot to thank for, you know, Jer and Paddy, because they, um, they, they sacrificed a lot for me to get me out to Drada, to get me up to Dublin for training. Um, twice a week, games on a Sunday, you know. But Douglas was just absolutely, you know, when someone walks in the room and it's just that presence straight away, like you, you, you're just in awe. So it turns out that uh, he met mum and dad and he was just brilliant all round. Um, I had to announce then on the Tuesday night to the Draw the United players, that was on the Tuesday, announced on the Tuesday night uh, to the players, um, and that Douglas was still over with Pat Devlin. We all went for a Chinese. And uh, the following Monday, I was gone to England. Jeez, that's kind of surreal stuff. Were you pinching yourself? Yeah, like uh, I was even when I got over to Blackburn, I was still pinching myself. I couldn't believe it, kind of thing, you know. And the big thing was at the time, my local radio station up in me is LMFM, and the big thing, the two big things that me, me mum and dad was telling me, um, was uh, Slane Castle going on fire and Gary Talon going to England. Right, and were people more sad about Slane Castle, do you think? Or, or? Yeah, there's a lot of people <laughs> happy to see me go, I tell you, you know. <laughs> Slane Castle was the big news at the time. <laughs> well, did, did Doug Leash at the time say why he was signing you? Did, did um, he just, I'd, I'd kind of been doing well with Rod United, you know, like I, was, I actually started up front, um, playing up front, so in a way I suppose you could tell my career went backwards because I ended up playing left back uh, by the end of it kind of thing but um, no he was um, he just uh, he, he probably himself and Pat Devlin were very close and they worked together at Liverpool and um, what it was Pat Devlin just put me onto the Gleesh and the Gleesh, um he kind of liked what he saw so it was great and I suppose Pat Devlin for our listeners would be synonymous with Bray Wanderers who's managed him a few times and he's also heavily linked to Damien Duff when da- Damien Duff went over absolutely he's an absolute brilliant man I have to say Connor. he's brilliant for me but he's brilliant for, for all the Irish you know I mean um, he's just a fantastic man and you couldn't thank him enough and, and I didn't thank him enough I suppose you know over the years kind of thing but I, I, he definitely deserves a mention and He'll always uh, be remembered by me. So, now you're in Blackburn, uh, you got Kenny Dalglish, probably one of the greatest players ever to play the game, as your manager. Um, Damien Duff mentioned in an interview recently about when he was an apprentice. Now, you went over at, at 18, so maybe it was a little bit different, but he mentioned kind of the difference from nowadays. He was cleaning showers and stuff like that, and he even said Kenny Dalglish might come in when the shower was just about cleaned with his muddy boots and turn on the shower so he'd have to start all over again. Oh. Um, what was it What was it like with, say, boot room and kind of, you know, what was your your day-to-day like in the club? Because, you know, you had come over for, you know, a fraction of what Alan Shearer comes over. So what what did you have to do apart from train every day? Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot. The biggest, the biggest problem with that was, um, was uh, filling in time because... A long day in football at that time, if, you, if, if it was a double session training, you'd still be gone for half two, maybe three o'clock. So that was the big problem I found. Um, and to deal, the homesickness was tough, I have to say. And um, the homesickness was tough. The club at the time, when I, when I first went over, they put me up in a hotel for a week. But they felt for me, because I was so young, that I, putting me into a family environment in digs was the best thing for me. So little naive Gary Talon went with that, no problem, and it was great. But it it wasn't um, it wasn't ideal, I have to say. And I, I I won't mention the names kind of thing, but the family I'll never forget for some reasons. Um, it was I never went in. I, I felt like Kenny Dalglish had bigger fish to fry. I didn't want to be wrecking his head about you know not being happy so, in digs. So the digs weren't great. Tell us about the digs. The digs. Well, uh, I went in November ninety one. In ninety two, they were moving house, and they rang me while I was in Ireland to tell me your room will be ready. Your room will be ready. And when I got back the day before pre season, little did I know that my room was going to be a horse box for two nights, Connor. <laughs> Was there a horse in it? Or? No, but there was fresh hay every night. I was <laughs> delighted with that. And so, you know, I know you can probably laugh at it now, but at the time, you were not much more than a kid, really. And, like, how did it eventually come about that Doug Leach finds out? That, 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 excuse the pun here, that was the straw that broke the donkey's back <laughs> because 
I, I was actually on the verge of packing it in. I says, I can't do this, but because of the reason. So I had a word with Kevin Moore first, and he says, listen, he says, go see Doug Leash. I have a word with Doug Leash. He says, you need to be talking. So uh, I went into the office, and I've had a few um, telling offs from Doug Leash. We're not, not giving him the ball in five sides or whatever, but this was up there with the best. He absolutely went through me for a shortcut for not saying I'm happy. He says, how do we know? What's going on if you don't tell us? So from then on, I, I moved out of the digs, moved in with a player, and from then on, it just went from there. It was brilliant. And so you didn't, you didn't originally. You need to be coaxed to go and speak to him. Like, is that because there was a big aura about the man? Was he unapproachable? Did you feel at that time, or absolutely not? I think it was just me myself. Uh, I think it was a bit of character building and realizing that. Um, I, I should have thought I didn't. I, I probably didn't want to be wrecking the man's head. I, maybe it is an awe, I suppose. Yeah, when you think about it, because you think this man, he's a lot to be dealing. With. He's not. You think he's not going to be worried about the young players, but it's far from the truth. So just going back to the, I suppose the squad that assembled and that eventually went on to win the league, and then we we'll speak about a couple of trips that you had um, uh, with the first team around that time, but the, the players. So Sutton and Shearer, we've mentioned. You know, you David Batty, who I suppose. Am I right in saying was the only one in the team at that point that kind of had won something at that stage? Had he won with Leeds the year previous? Yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, he was. And and do you know about David Batty? Um, he he was a lot better player than people gave him credit for. He had ability. He was known as the hard man, the tough tackling man, but he could play as well. And a character, a brilliant character in the dressing room. And like you mentioned the money, but when you go through the squad, there was definitely money spent. I think it was like, 25 million when you, you count the ins and outs, which was a lot of money back then. But you weren't buying, you know, ready made players or players that had won much really in their career. So, you know, what kind of a job do you think Doug Leash did to mould that squad together to, to eventually win a league? Doug Leash was, was a brilliant man, uh, but he also had a good man by his side, and, and Lord of Mercy has passed on since Ray Hafford. An absolute fantastic coach. He he was he was a gem, and himself and Doug Leash worked well. But Ray Halford set up training sessions, um, that you would have loved, Connor. You know, at the time, um, he was just brilliant. The way he turned a simple crossing and shooting into developing play, he was just uh, they were they were a great team. Um, Doug, Doug Leash and Ray Halford. And uh, Halford would stay with the club for. For years after Doug Leach left, am I right in saying that? Yeah, he did. He yeah. did, and it, like I, I, I left Blackburn after four and a half years, and I just sat down with Ray, and Ray just said, "Look, it's probably not going to happen." But he was an absolute gentleman to deal with, and the way he ordered things, and I, even after I moved on, you know, he was um, a brilliant man. Let's talk about that. Well, how how did uh, how did Blackburn at the time, did, you know, break the the, the information to you? To say right, um, there's not going to be place for you in the first team. Uh, did they help you go elsewhere, or was it just a conversation? They were brilliant. They were absolutely. Um, it, it was with Ray Halford, really. Um, what it was, I, I initially in '91 I signed a three and a half year deal, and at the end of that deal, um, Kenny Douglas offered me a new uh, two year deal, which I signed, and I was a year into the deal, and um, I just there was a couple of clubs. Looking at me, you know, a lot of scouts at reserve matches every week. And uh, there was a few clubs l looking at me kind of thing. So Ray Halford just sat down one day and he said, look, Kilmarnock, I've been watching you. Um, I've been play I was playing as a, a centre-half at that time, believe it or not, in the reserves. And I was captain of the reserves. Um, and they they like what they saw at centre-half, but they were looking for a left-back. So they asked uh, Blackburn, which I got told, they asked Blackburn, would they play me left-back in the following week? So I did, and luckily enough, did well, kind of thing, and it just happened from there, you know. And I, I was, I knew myself, it was time to move on, kind of thing, you know. Four and a half years, had a fantastic time with the club, a lot of brilliant people, a lovely family club, and um, lots of great memories. But it was time to move on. Before we speak uh, about Kilmarnock, and we will, um, just I suppose you, that team wins the league. You train with them every day. Obviously, the money that's spent is really difficult to break into, probably the most difficult team to break into at that point. Um, just some of the players, like Colin Hendry at the back, Jeff Kenna, obviously, who those of us in Ireland will remember as being a, a very solid player. Uh, Tim Sherwood was, was the captain, I think, was he at the he time? Was. He um, was. 
you know, what was it like in around the dressing room with those guys uh, playing and training every day? What, what what kind of guys were they? They were kind of you couldn't speak highly enough of them. It was it was a brilliant dressing room, as you know about football more than anyone. Um, when the banter is good in the dressing room, but the banter will be good in the dressing room equally when you're getting results and when things are going well. It's easy to have the banter, but the, the, everyone was. Uh, don't get me wrong; they were competitive and they wouldn't think twice of falling out with each other on the pitch, on the training pitch. Or on the pitch, they weren't afraid to tell each other. But I think that's why it worked. But they, they were brilliant with the young players too. You know, that's why it was such a family club at the time. Um, everyone was together, kind of thing. You know, and there was no, but the, the, the crack was ninety. And uh, Hinningborg was signed um, in January '93 from uh, Lillestrøm. I went on obviously to Manchester United. Um, what did you think when, the, like, it's easy to have the Shearers and Sherwoods in at the time? Well, you know. What goes on at a club when this lad from Norway just comes in and no one has a clue who he is? Like, did he did they instantly take to him or? Oh they, well, they did because he, he he had a nice persona about him kind of thing. But he was an unsung hero, as and he went on to have the most fantastic career, as you know. But one little thing I'll always remember about Henning Berg is, and he was an inspiration to. What we'd say is, like when the training was finished, Connor. All of us, you know, we do a warm down or whatever, but. Even in the dressing room, after training, after the warm down, he was still stretching against the wall or still doing his stretches. He was still warming down. Just It was just a little thing that always stuck with me, just the pure professional looking after his body, stretching to the end, you know? Uh, I'm, I imagine at that time he might have got a little bit of a stick in the dressing room for doing those kind of things. Yeah, you could you could see the eyes looking round and all the lads laughing, thinking, what's he up to, you know and, what I mean? And who in the dressing room would have been more open to that kind of thing? Would... would would a Graham Lassau kind of be open to that? Would a Mike Newell not be so open to it, maybe? <laughs> Mikey Newell. Mikey Newell. Oh, listen, Mick Newell was one of the wind-up merchants on the club. There was a few, but Mick Newell was up there with the best of them. And uh, he'd be another one that wouldn't uh, hide behind the door when he had to say something. Again, if you didn't like it, tough. And um, do you think, like, at the end of the day, that was a big part of a successful team in terms of you need to be mentally strong coming through the doors in the morning type thing. Oh, totally. You leave, you leave your feelings at the gate. Um, but the, the training was competitive. It was it was very competitive. And uh, I think that's the old famous saying, like when you cross the white line, you take that with you, train as you play. Um, I know football has changed a lot since. You know what I mean? We're talking uh, 91, 25 years ago. But... Um, the funny thing was training, like uh, the the training pitch has come a long way since then. They have a fine setup now, Brockall, and I was lucky enough to be part of that now for a while before I left. But when I first went over, Connor, Pleasanton was the training pitch, a public park with a road going through it, because there was a graveyard at the top. And every time a funeral was coming up, we had to stop training. And even some of the lads were pinging balls trying to hit the cars. They were playing skittles with the balls. So <laughs> things, some things you just don't forget. Pleasanton. Um. You mentioned Doug Leash and the five sides. Obviously, it's kind of well documented. Kind of what training in Liverpool when he was there was very kind of modern, really. When you think of it now, whereas the, most clubs would have been just running the players to the ground, whereas they were just kind of playing football, really. Was was the training like that? Was the five sides on a Friday before a game on a Saturday? Or? There, there was the the five sides for the the first team on a Friday. Little five aside kind of thing. There was actually seven keepers at one stage. If we go from youths up to first team, there was seven keepers at one stage. And a first team game, whether it be home or away, they wouldn't do a, a, a big warm up. They'd do a five aside, but they wouldn't do it for too long kind of thing. But uh, two of those keepers would be kept for the five asides. Shearer would very rarely be in the five asides because he'd take the other five keepers over to another goal and he'd just start shooting. And then he shoots, man. He scores, you know, the crack. But he'd take the five keepers and they'd all take turns. And he was just bang, bang, bang. And then he'd go out and do the same thing on a Saturday. He was God in that club. Uh, and, like, that's self-practice, obviously. Do you mm. know what I mean? Was, was there anybody else at that? Was Shearer the leading light? Was there anyone else that went away and did something specific to their position and went, right, I'm going to do X, Y and Z? Well, you'd have to you'd have to look at the keepers. That's it, the, the two mm. keepers at the time. And, you know, more or less... More often during the week, keepers would train with the, the goalkeeping coach, Terry Geno. Um, but Shea gave him t- Tim Flowers when he came to the club. He, he he gave himself the nickname, 
he, he was a fantastic bloke, Tim Flowers, but he gave himself the nickname of the cat. Right. Yeah, because he could spring into the top corner, but he gave him the nickname, you know, himself. But he was fantastic. He was a, a, a brilliant pro as well. So it, it, it comes, I suppose, then you've already explained, it comes to a time where you got to leave and, uh, and you go to Kilmarnock. Um, you know, I suppose in, in many ways you've already seen the highs and lows of being a footballer. You were actually in a few Champions League squads were you, with Blackburn before, before you left. Yeah, I was. I was lucky enough to be in a, in a couple of squads and um, when, when they um, went out to Moscow, um, Spartak Moscow, and I was lucky enough to be in that squad. And that was an experience in itself. Um, it was just surreal. Like, and we got to see a bit of Moscow before the game, kind of thing. It was so, the, so this is Russia in, in you know early nineties. Oh, well, yeah, ninety mid nineties. Yeah, yeah, but ninety five, yeah. and um, we were sponsored by Asics at the time, and uh, Asics had to make us certain. Um, I'm going to say long johns, Connor. <laughs> I'm going to say long johns. I won't say tights. But uh, Asics made us these special gear because we went over there. It was minus fourteen, and um, you know, like special socks and everything. It was nuts, kind of thing. It was it was it was Baltic, and uh, but it was it was we saw a bit of Moscow, you know, the Kremlin, blah blah blah. But it was um, we saw the poor side, a massive place, and we we saw two sides. We saw the poor side of it and the the money end of it, kind of thing. And. You got a specific job at that game, if I remember correctly, did you? Did, did someone give you a job to do? Yeah, it's funny, um, Mr. Alan Shearer, because the dressing rooms were dodgy, and they they looked very dodgy, he um, he asked me would I mind his watch from. I said, yeah, no problem. It's a, So I looked, it's a Rolex, he says, do you mind me asking Al how much uh, this is insured for? He went 10 grand. So, Connor, I didn't see a bit of the game. I was just holding my wrist and just looking down for 90 minutes. Apparently, there was a fight on the pitch with uh, two teammates. <laughs> so, was that the, the LaSalle Batty uh, incident? Yeah, was? the famous one, yeah. It and, was, um, and I, I mean, I'm just trying to think what kind of an environment it was that you were the least dodgy person to, 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 give, a, to give a watch. <laughs> um, but anyway, you minded the watch, you give it back to Shearer, and the next step, I suppose, was Kilmarnock. Um what was that like? Where, did you move in and around the area? I did. I, I, I lived in a place called Troon. It was about 10 minutes from Kilmarnock. It was out on the coast. It was, it was, it was lovely now. Um, but um, Alec Totten was the manager at the, sign that's, at the time that signed me. Um, and um, <coughs> Excuse me, Connor. It was, um, I noticed a big difference straight away between English football and Scottish football um, at that time. Um, the fitness, it's probably the toughest pre-seasons I've done was up in up in Scotland. Um, and I wasn't. I was never the best long-distance runner. Never. Uh, but I had to be up there. Uh, it was it was tough going. It was a lot of running, physical, you know, end of it kind of thing. And, like, it was. Di I know it was slightly different times. It's not that long ago when you think of it. It was slightly different times. But, like, do you, when, when you look back at that kind of pre-season, do you kind of think, you know... Was it? A, did you feel fitter, or was it? Did you feel like it was a waste of time? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know really. I, it was, it was just tough going. I, I just remember, I remember some of the running we had to. I, I've never seen any anything like it. Mm. Um, probably the fittest I've been, you know, in the whole time. But the, I felt at the time that football was forgotten about, mm. if you know what I mean. So it was more to the fitness end of it. Of course, you have to be fit to play football, but at the end of the day. The, the, it's a different kind of fitness, isn't it? It so, is. So you, you're being trained there for long distance running, like you Absolutely. say. Um, Absolutely. And then that that can take its toll on your body. Um, Hundred percent. So so Kilmarnock, I know one of the games you played when you were up there was was against Celtic. Tell us who was playing for Celtic at, at that time. At the time, there was a certain Paolo De Canio. He was playing for Celtic. There was George Cadetti. There was Paul McStay. There was Big Pierre Van Heidunk. Now I was lucky enough, Connor, to play. Against them twice, home and away, um, and we we took the lead at home. And I remember it was thunder and lightning and everything, and uh, we took the lead at home, and then the Canio just kicked into gear, and he just it ended up. I think it was three one. Um, the away game, um, was playing for against Celtic. Your biggest night of your life at Celtic Park, and I'm thinking lovely fields of Atten Rise playing. Everything's good. Forty four thousand, I think it was, and um, all I had to do, Connor. Was take a free kick. I was playing centre half now. There was a mismatch straight away, me against Pierre Van Heidunk. But anyway, um, all I had to do was take a, a free kick and send it as far as I could, yeah. 
No, do you think I could do it? I miss hit the ball. The ball goes straight to Paul Max Day. He hits it first time over my head, and I'm all you can see is the permed head of George Cadetti, and I'm thinking, please don't score, please don't score. So anyway, he sticks it in the bottom corner. Talon has an assist for the first goal. <laughs> so things didn't go too bad for me after that. It was just a bad, you know, it was a bad first goal to give away kind of thing. But um, I got taken off after 78 minutes, and we were 3-0 then. Thank God I wasn't at fault for anything else. Um, so I went in the dressing room with my head between my legs and blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking 3-0. So the lads come in anyway, and there's boots flying everywhere, throwing everything off. And I said, 3-0, yeah. And he went, 6-0 to the player beside me so nothing needs to be said after that <laughs> and like that was Tommy Burns Celtic was it at the time or was no it, it was... I think do you know I can't remember that yeah because it, yeah. Cadet, Cadet I think it was just before or Vim Janssen might have been there but that, that was a team like with flair and it wasn't oh, it they was were, just they like were Cadet the yeah. Canio, um I remember you know. the Canio one stage in that game that 6-0 game he was he played playing on the left wing and he started soloing the ball down the line, it must have been seven or eight times, just keeping it up in the air, running down the wing. It was he's fantastic. He was a fantastic player, fantastic pro, um, and um, it was nice to say you, you played against him, kind of thing. He was, yeah. he was a brilliant man. Yeah, and got an assist. And got an assist. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think I was the only man to play for one team and get man the match for the other. That <laughs> so. Listen, you've nothing but positive things really to say about Blackburn, uh, apart from uh, that night or two in 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 not the the best living arrangements. But uh, as a club and the people and the management and the coaches and the players and everything, um, and you go to Kilmarnock, was it a bit more of a rocky road up there? It w- it was initially, as I said, um, the manager signed me. He only lasted a few games into the season. Um, Alec Totten and then they they sacked um, Alec Totten so Bobby Williamson who was the then manager of the reserves he took over and uh, listen football is a, is a very fickle sport at times you know if, um, if someone doesn't like you they don't like you I'm not saying as a person but as a player he just didn't like me so um, I wasn't in in Bobby's plans the problem was I still have I still had um, over a year and a half of a contract to run and um it was one of them. Bobby wanted rid of me at the club, and I wasn't prepared to leave um, until I obviously I was going to be out of work kind of thing after mm. it. So to cut it out, to, to summarise it really, Connor, um, one of the players, um, I had to hire an agent, Connor, to be honest, to do this talk and for me because um, I'd never had an agent before as such. Obviously, Pat Devlin was the man for me, um, but I hired this agent and talking to him on the phone. He was going to do the talking with the club, well, i.e. Bobby. So. Um, Mark Steele was this agent's name and he told me look you're going to go through hell basically he says because he's going to make your life hell to get rid of you so you'll crack and you'll just leave um, but I'm telling you if you stick it out we'll break them so basically he had two players that um, was going through a similar situation at other clubs and they folded they just couldn't do it anymore so Bobby didn't want me so Bobby says to me um, right yeah, don't come in for training on Monday morning uh, come in, sorry, he says, at um, 8 o'clock in the morning. Now, training wouldn't have started with the boys till half 10. So I come in at 8 o'clock and uh, his assistant, Kenny Thompson, was there. And uh, he ran me until I nearly got sick. So that was Grant, ran me. as He says, right, you go home now. He says, I'll come back in at 3 in the afternoon the same day. So I says, right. So uh, I did that. All the boys were gone again. Ran me again, absolutely ran me till I collapsed nearly. So this you could see the trend that was happening very quickly, trying to break me. Um, next day, same crack. That week, same crack. Um, the agent is telling me on the phone. He says, "Look," he says, "I know it's easy for me to sit in my big black chair here and tell you to hang in there, but it will." So I did. I did that for five weeks, kind of morning and afternoon. And I, I, the mental side I took of it for, was that, uh, hey, you're just getting fitter for your next club. So I used it in a positive way. I didn't let it get me down. I didn't let it break me. In the end, I broke Bobby, you know. And uh, and listen, no hard feelings there. And I wouldn't uh, criticize. He had to do what he had to do, but I but did. So it's it's crazy time though when you think of it. People give out about player power and stuff like that now. But I mean, you you're talking there before things really changed. Probably there was money in the game in Scotland at the time. Yeah. But but the manager was. You know, still the man, if you like, in the yeah, club. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. if if that happened now, 
you, you know, you have bomb squads if you like now. And you you yeah. think of Wolves when they get, get relegated from the Premier League and you've, you've got three or four guys that don't train with the first team. But it's more psychological torture there rather than like you went through the mental side and the physical side there. Yeah, I did. And it's a fine line. You can go one way or the other with it because... And there was times, don't get me wrong, there was times I was going back to the house thinking, oh man, what am I going to do here, kind of thing. But mm. the next time I had to go in then, I just said, no, stick it out, boy. Stick it out. And what, what's, it, what's it like? Because I think it's a different world for, for like football fans or whatever, uh, uh, looking in, they see a, a footballer, you know, an SPL footballer or a Premier League footballer, and like they don't see this human side to it at all. What was it like going in for lunch with the rest of the players when... It's clear, basically, manager wants you out. Like, what's well? That, that's one thing I have to say. That, like, the players in Kilmarnock were fantastic. Like, basically, when I'd be coming in for my say afternoon running session, um, the the players might be just there might be a few lads still there, kind of thing, you know, after having to share or whatever. But they they obviously couldn't be seen to be uh, talking to me as such uh, in the sense that, but they come and have a quiet word and say, "You hang in there," or you know, I had players like, and it was fantastic, and that gave you encouragement. The players probably put themselves in that position. They're thinking, "Hey, that could be any one of us now." Going mm. through that, but every club I'd been to, the players, the whole t- the whole dressing room stuck together. I found that now. I was lucky enough to be part of that. Yeah, good. Uh, you eventually moved on, um, and you know where you found your home that you, that you stayed for quite a, l- a long time was Mansfield Town, and um, when I was going to do a little bit of dirty work on you. Um, <laughs> It would appear that you were a bit of a crowd favourite. How how did that come about? Um, the Mansfield thing came about. Um, the agent, as I said, that I hired in um, for the Kilmarnock uh, trauma, we'll say, um, he actually set up a trial with Barnsley. And uh, Barnsley were in the Premiership at the time, but they were going down. And my first day on a Monday morning in Barnsley was after, I think it was a heavy defeat to Arsenal. I'm going to guess 5 1, Connor, but. Yeah, you're talking Bar- Neil Redford. Neil Redford. Bar- Bar- Barnsley, yeah. 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 Danny, well, Danny Wilson was the, the, manager, the manager at the time, yeah. yeah. And Neil Redford was the, I think he was the captain, I think he was. Yeah. But um, so I did the Monday. And I actually spent seven weeks at Barnsley, kind of, on trial. I, I think it was a, the trial went on longer than OJ Simpson's trial. So <laughs> I was there for seven weeks, had a fantastic time, but I was there that long. I thought I might have got a testimonial after it, but no. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great club. And um, it just wasn't going to happen there. But in that meantime, how the Mansfield thing came about was I played for Barnsley Reserves against a Mansfield first team behind closed doors. And Connor, when I tell you I just kicked everyone and won the ball, I just kicked everyone and won the ball. And I I, I really played my heart out that day. And um, I didn't know at the time, um, but the the Mansfield manager who was there, um, Steve Parkin, um, he, he liked what I did kind of thing. And... Um, when things didn't happen at Barnsley, he obviously wanted to hear what was happening with me, and I went from there, and that's what happened. Signed for Mansfield, and Steve Parkin was absolutely brilliant for me. I was his type of player, and he was just a brilliant man, brilliant motivator, and uh, at a small club, but the dressing room there was absolutely amazing, Connor. Small League Two club, fighting for everyone, fighting for each other, but the camaraderie and the team spirit and the fans were absolutely brilliant. And. At the time, it was kind of mid-season, was it, when you went and you were there till the end of the season initially, was it? That's right, and then um, I was, uh, he initially, he wanted me, he, he took me to the club and he couldn't sign me until he, there was another player, John Doolan, and he was moving to Barnet. And when he got rid of John Doolan, then I could sign him, but he just kept me at the club then until he could do that, I think it was a week or two. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, I was able to sign. Like, was it instantly a breath of fresh air, or from the Kilmarnock situation, or did you get there and think, "I'm going to make sure this isn't a Kilmarnock"? You know? When I, I, it was just a fact, Connor, to be playing in a first team on a Saturday afternoon with with the with the dressing room that it was, was absolutely just. It was the best feeling ever. Back kicking the ball, you put that behind you. You, I, I think I became a stronger man because of the whole Kilmarnock thing. You know. Um, again, you have to just be mentally strong and just think. Well, he like one of the one of the things Bobby Williams had did say to me at the time. He was calling me in again, another trying to break it. But he says, "Look, he says I've rang everybody in England. Nobody wants you." Blah blah blah. So I just looked at him. I says, "Well, I'll prove you wrong." So that's what happened, and I was delighted just to and get like, back playing. And like it was very difficult at, at that time because 
now a scout or an agent or, or whatever can just you know go on to all all these different like Y Scout or Prozone or whatever and they can watch the reserve game from their sitting room like do you know what I mean but I imagine if you're you with Kilmarnock reserves at that time like it could be your last job in football like you got to be thinking that at the time oh yeah absolutely and you, you just like when you know when you know you, you just know you're going through a tough time you don't know what the future holds kind of thing but Again, football is psychological, and you have to be mentally strong in football as well as physically. Um, it's the mental side because you have a lot of time. You have a bad game, bad training session, and it depends how you deal with it. Mm. You want to, you, you know, you, you really want that next game or that next training session to put it right because you go home at three o'clock in the day and you, you you're stewing over it and you're you're thinking, uh, you know, you can't wait for the next morning to put it right, and especially. Uh, uh, if you're, if you're given the pink jersey, you're getting voted the worst trainer. Not me personally, I'm just saying this is what went on. The, the pink jersey, you always wearing the pink jersey, but you start getting that jersey. I've seen lads getting the jersey a few days in a row, and you know yourself, kind of. It is, it is, your, your confidence. It's, yeah. a, it's a confidence thing. Well, I got to pick jer pink jersey at a much lower level, so I do know, <laughs> I do, I do know what you're talking about. Um, uh, I think some people thought it was my killer for a while. But, um, so, Mansfield, so you played about, I think it was 80 games there, was it? Uh, yeah, it was in around that. A few yeah. more, and uh, you scored twice, so I'm guessing you, you didn't stay as a striker when you, when you, when you oh, got there. Oh, man, but what? the two goals, oh, listen, well, the second goal was against South End, and I scored, it was an absolute screamer from about two and a half yards out. <laughs> a screamer now. And I think it bounced three times before it went over the line. <laughs> well, I've seen you play with the kids now, like, and you don't miss from two and a half yards. Of you. Um, and what was the other one? Was it the, other, the other one was. Uh, Come on, there's only fucking two. You can surely remember yeah, the second. Man, I got two nosebleeds uh, did twice when I scored because I've never been that far up the pitch. But the first one was against Peterborough, and uh, I was lucky enough. It was uh, a free kick taken, flick on from Lee Peacock. You always remember your first goal. <laughs> That's Lee and Peacock, that. Queens Park Rangers did he go into? He went to Man City Man actually City. from from um, from yeah. Mansfield. Yeah, he got a, he got a great move um, to to Man City. Yeah, but um, he was a uh, up front. Yeah, he's a fit lad. He, but he was one of these lads. Connor, he was an exception to the rule. This boy, you know, like you, you get your regimental uh, pasta, yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah, he could eat what he wanted. I remember him having a Vindaloo pizza and cheese toasty uh, the night before a game in Mansfield and went on and scored two or three goals the next day. He was an exception. And um, ju ju just with Mansfield, I suppose you were remembered by, by the fans ev even till now, really, if you, if you have a look at kind of being your heart in your sleeve type uh, player. And it was a very good time for the club at that period in its career because or in its history because... It's in it's in the football league now, but it it has been out of the league quite a bit, right? Absolutely. So, so yeah. like, th what type of a player were you when you were there? Where, where were you playing, and, and do you know what was the team like on my, the pitch? My game, Connor, was just I, I was a heart and a sleeve player. I was a hundred percent. I got stuck in. I was a mouth on the pitch, positively, um, but I just. I just gave it my all, Connor. I just ran myself into the ground, and the, the, especially the Mansfield fans at the time. It suited Steve Park, and that's the player he was looking for. So it, it worked well for both of us. But the fans were absolutely—they were brilliant to me. They, they, you know what I mean? They knew I was limited, Connor. I was never going to do a Crave Torn because if I did, I'm sure I put the knee out, kind of thing. But I was—I um, was just a hundred percent player who who gave everything, kind of thing. Hey, you spoke about your knee. So, what age were you when the knee finally gave up? I think it was 26, nearly 27, I think it was, um, and it, I was after having three operations, and it was just a case of um, the last operation, the surgeon had said to me, he says, look, he says, uh, I'm not sure, he says, this is just a 60,000 mile service, like, you know, so he just, he, he kind of knew himself, I came home for the summer then, and I was doing a bit of running at home, Connor, and um, the knee was just swelling up and swelling up, and it was just like... No, nah, there's something not right here. So when everyone was off on holiday, so I couldn't ring on. So the first day back for pre-season, I went back to see the surgeon, and he says, he says, look, I, he says to be honest with you, I, I didn't want to say the time, let you go home and try it, you know. But he says, I think it's time to call it. He says, if you want to walk when you're 35, he says, he says, I think it's time to call it day, especially with my game, Connor. I had to get around the pitch, get at lads, you know, um, and it wouldn't have happened, you know. And like 26, when you think about it, you're you're going into the prime of your career. Like, surely nothing prepares you really for that conversation at that time. Wallop. It's a good look because, as I say, school suffered because of football. 
there was so many things sacrificed and, and th th all of a sudden you get the news that uh, it's time to call it a day, you know, and it's just, uh, it's surreal because you don't actually, again, you're pinching yourself for all the wrong reasons, you know, at this time and it just, uh, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't deal with it great, now I have to say, Connor, I, I, I actually went off the rails for a while kind of thing. Not a great way to deal with it, but when you look back... Uh, but I mean, were you helped? Do you know what I mean? Was it was, I know Mansfield isn't a, a, a team at the time that would have had a massive staff. Yeah. But, but like, was it pretty much that conversation with the physio and with the doctors, you know... You know, you're released and best to look for the rest of your life type thing. Or? Don't get me wrong. I was helped. Um, you, whatever money you're entitled to, you know, mm. you know, through injury and you know, six months left to me contract kind of thing. That particular contract. Um, well, uh, sorry, I had a year. Sorry, but um, I was looked after that way, and and you know everything. But it's it's life goes on kind of thing, you know. And it was a case of um, well. You know, football's over now. But it was much... It, when I, I was trying to go into the club still for a few days, um, trying to watch the lads train and that, and no, it just says, no, you have to move on here, you know. Now, again, Connor, as I say, I didn't deal with it. Um, looking back, it's easy to, to see how I dealt with it. But, like, uh, I went on the beer for a while, Connor, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and I got a job eventually. Got a job eventually working in a quarry in Mansfield for four pounds seventy five an hour, twelve hour shifts, Connor. And the lads, they'd still give my kid a Wednesday off in Mansfield, the footballers, and they'd but they'd run on Tuesday to get this Wednesday off. And they came to see me afterwards and they went, "Come on, we're going out for a drink tonight. You coming out for a drink tonight?" Uh, I'd say, "Lads, I'm up at uh, half six in the morning doing a twelve hour shift in the quarry," and I could see in their faces the scared look. They're like, "Whoa, yeah, for four pounds seventy five an hour, Connor." And does that even make the social scene difficult in terms of you hang around with footballers, you're a footballer, that's kind of your, your bubble, if you like. Now you're working outside of football, you know, it breaks up your whole social spectrum. Like It, it does, in fairness, like you just, um, even with the lads, like, you, you know, when you move to a new club, when, you, when you've when you moved from club to club, there you're new teammates now kind of thing, you know, of course, always keep in touch, like, in touch with, like, like, Chris Malone's still here now and Tommy Morgan and that, you know. Um, but you you just move on. But you, you said that almost like it was a positive, but <laughs> <laughs> if anyone knows Chris Malone or Tommy Morgan it's, it's, yeah. go, sorry, go ahead. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> um yeah, no, you just you you just move on and life just changed for me then. But um my saving grace was actually getting the job in the quarry because um, it, it was it was very easy to get caught in a bubble and again I was saying I couldn't answer mum and dad might be ringing me from Ireland and I was I, I was obviously down I was, and I couldn't talk to them and I'll tell you a funny story actually kind of was um, nobody knew at home what was happening and I was, I was drinking and um, eventually I plucked up the courage to answer the phone one evening uh, to dad dad rang he says what's up you're not in great form is dad Stomach's not the best, Dad, you know, but he, he didn't have a clue. He says, it's not the best. He says, uh, have a brandy and port. And I says, yeah, brandy and port. He says, yeah, it'll settle your stomach. I says, okay. So brandy and port was my new drink for the next week then. <laughs> but, I mean, when you think of it, and you, you've already spoke about, you know, massive highs, playing play, playing in Celtic Park in front of 44,000 people, and... Then, like a Mansfield, I think you've 40 games in a season, one of the seasons, so like you're on the up again. Um, so, in, in, in many respects, despite the kind of knockbacks and everything, your career is a success because, I mean, how many Irish kids go over to England and, and never play a professional game, you know? Yeah, I, I, I've been blessed, Connor, and I, I swear, like, I, I look back and I've, I'm just so grateful for those nine years in football, like, I'll never forget it. There's pictures at home, and there's you know there's little memorabilia at home, and it's just it's it was it was a dream come true to be able to follow your dream. Okay, things didn't work out, but I was I'm grateful for every single day, every single minute I was on the training pitch at whatever club, whatever dressing room I was in. It was just the most fantastic, surreal experience ever, you know. And to say that you did follow your dream, and it's because a lot of things did suffer. Believe me, you should see my grades in the leaving cert, Connor. There is none. <laughs> But, uh, like, you mentioned that, but, uh, like, looking back now, would you have any advice to kind of that 15, that 16-year-old, or even that 18-year-old now that goes a little bit later, which is maybe happening even more now in Ireland? What would your advice to that young aspiring footballer be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
obviously it has changed a lot now, Connor. I, I I would say like to make sure that you know going over to make sure that everything is in place, everything is right, everything is there for them that they're going to be looked after, and um, that uh, that the family's mind a uh, peace of mind. Um, I just think that uh, definitely, I would say, make sure school is a part of it and education, and just have that something to fall back on. Back on, sorry, um, just to, to be all around, just to make sure everything's right before you, because it is a big move. It is. It's a. It's a massive step to take. It's a fantastic step to take, but uh, in football, you just never know. So, just just make sure everything's in place and everyone's happy. Okay. Very good. Gary Tallon, I've got to say I'm off to um, research YouTube and try and find that assist in Celtic Park. <laughs> thanks very much for your time and hopefully the listeners have enjoyed listening to your football story. Connor, thanks a million for having me. So if you've made it this far, then perhaps that means you enjoyed it and maybe even found it a bit insightful. That's our goal here on footballdiscovery.com. Gary Tallon in 1995 didn't quite make it onto the pitch during a Champions League game. That means he wasn't a Champions League footballer. But I think you'll agree with me. Listening to him here today share his football story makes him a Champions League man. We hope that any aspiring young footballers will learn from his story. Please join us next week when Derek McCarthy takes us down into the world of sports science. It's going to be very educational for players and coaches alike, and is a cannot miss. Stick to the website, Facebook and Twitter to keep you updated. Please comment and make requests, and we'll do our best to meet your demands. Thank you for stopping by to footballdiscovery.com, where coaching and learning meet.